one minute. So, Ali, uh, we can go ahead. Dear all, good afternoon. My name is Sophie. My name is Sofia Schiza and I'm the chair of IRS Group 402. And on behalf of myself and my co-chairs, Marisa Monsignora and Andrea Liberti, we would like to welcome you in this webinar led by Group 402. Further than that, it's a continuum of a working group of experts that was launched with the aim to provide suggestions for sleep lab operation during pandemics or endemics. Um, our three distinguished uh, speakers uh, will include in their presentations preliminary results uh, of our work as flowcharts, and hopefully soon a paper will be submitted. In, after their presentations, a discussion will follow, and in order to be stimulated, uh, you are all very welcome to submit a question using the chat platform in your screen, and um, you are we are uh, very uh, uh, pleased, uh, please do so. Um, and in the end, uh, the closing remarks will be made by Marisa Monsignore. And uh, without uh, any further delay, I will pass the microphone to Professor Andrea Liberti, who is uh, the chair of uh, our assembly for. Andrea. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Andrea Liberti, the head of Assembly 4. That, as Sofia just said, is the place uh, within the European Respiratory Society dedicated to sleep and breathing disorder. It is the place uh, where scientists and clinicians interested in sleep and everything related to sleep and breathing can meet uh, and share their ideas. Uh, I would like to take this uh, nice occasion to invite you to provide your active participation, uh, to bring your new ideas uh, to all the activities uh, of the Assembly 4 uh, in the future. Uh, I uh, now pass uh, without hesitation uh, to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Winfried Randerat uh, from the University of Cologne that uh, will start uh, talking about obesity, obst uh, obstructive sleep apnea and COVID-19. Please, Winfried. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you, Sophia and Marisa for the invitation and also Ma Ma Ali for organizing this, this program. It's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for uh, allowing me to take part in this um, um, event. Um, I have, do not have anything to disclose regarding this presentation. It does not any, include any uh, co commercial aspects. Let me start with a question to you. What do you think? Which, is, which of the following statements is correct? The prevalence of overweight and obese is 40 to 50% in most European countries. Obstructive sleep apnea uh, increases the mortality of COVID-19 by 2.5 fold, or ethnicity, obesity, and poor outcome of COVID-19 seems to be seem to be associated. What is your opinion? Please vote. So can we see some results? Well, the, 
prevalence is only estimated to be 12% 12, 12 only estimated the overweight and obese 40 to 50%. Uh, one quarter um, thinks that OSA increases the mortality, but the majority says that ethnicity, obesity, and poor outcome are associated with each other. So let's see um, what we can discuss, how we can discuss this in, in the talk. So let me start with a case report. This is a patient from our hospital. Uh, it's, he, he was born in 1972. With a, he has a high body mass index of 45 kilograms per square meter. His comorbidity was arterial, was arterial hypertension. He presented on uh, the 9th of April with calf dyspnea for two days. And he deteriorated, uh, deteriorated within the same day with hypoxic failure, uh, non-invasive ventilation, uh, high flow oxygen failed, so he needed uh, invasive ventilation on the same day. He was ventilated from April the 4th to June the 2nd, so more than um, almost two months. Within this time period, he had to uh, be treated with extracorporeal membrane oxygenation he had complications with severe pulmonary um, hemorrhage. Uh, he could not be ventilated anymore because of his low pulmonary compliance. However, after two, mon two months of treatment, he had full rehabilitation. He was full conscious, uh, chair mobili mobilized and um, could take oral feeding. On, on June the 4th, he celebrated his birthday with our nurses. So this is an example of a, a severely obese patient suffering from COVID-19. Obesity and overweight is a huge problem within Europe and as it is all over the world. Here are some data from uh, Europe uh, showing that the prevalence of overweight and obese, so a, a body mass index above 25, is uh, above 50% of the population in almost all countries over Europe. So it's not 40 to 50, as you all suggested. Um, actually, it is really uh, above 50 and even higher. So how are obesity and COVID-19 associated? We know from very early study that there is a close relationship uh, between uh, obesity and the severity of COVID-19. These are data, data from France, a retrospective analysis from um, including 124 patients with, with um, um, COVID-19. And they were compared to a group of uh, patients uh, admitted to the intensive care ward within the same time, but without COVID-19. And as you can see here, there is a, um, uh, a significantly higher uh, percentage of um, obesity in patients with COVID-19 compared to those without COVID-19. And moreover, there was a high risk of mechanical ventilation and it increased with a body mass index. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the risk factor for poor outcome has also been described in other studies. Once again, inter inter intensive invasive mechanical ventilation um, was uh, significantly higher in uh, obese patients. So the, increased, the risk increased by 3.2. It was a risk of obesity, not, not of obstructive sleep apnea. And this is not only true for the general population, but also for younger patients. As you can see here, age below 60 years was also associated with substantially increased risk for admission to intensive care um, and uh, also admission to hospital in all these uh, patients. So it's not only a problem of COVID-19, but also a problem of young people with COVID-19. However, are there other factors? And these are data from New York. 
um, asking for the relation between ethnicity, obesity, and COVID-19. And as you um, all um, uh, suggested in the question in the beginning, there was a, the highest mortality and obesity rates were in Bronx and Brooklyn. And it was also in Hispanic and black people um, showing uh, that there is a association on the one hand with obesity in these quarters and also with uh, mortality of COVID-19 in these quarter and in these ethnical groups. So this is another contribution to the actual discussion on ethnicity uh, and um, healthcare and risk of uh, mortality. What can we learn about pathophysiology in the relation between obesity and um, COVID-19? Um, these data show not only that there is a longer weaning time, longer period of positive swaps, longer hospital stay, uh, there are also some important aspects showing that obese patients with COVID-19 had higher inflammatory markers and worse pulmonary parameters. And also they showed higher oxygen demand. So this might guide us to some pathophysiological questions. What about lung function? Here are data of, of lung function um, associated with body mass index. And against our um, gut feeling, only few parameters are associated with obesity. It's actually only the expiratory resp um, 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 resting volume which uh, decreases with body mass index. And this is closely related to ventilation perfusion mismatch and uh, oxygen uh, demand. Another aspect is the inflammatory disease, um, the, the aspect of inflammatory disease in obesity. Adipose uh, tissue produces several adipokines, including leptin and adiponectin. Uh, leptin is a pro-inflammatory pro adipokine. Adiponectin, predominant, predominantly anti-inflammatory adipokine. And these, um, um, mediators influence the inflammatory process. The adipocytes are closely related to the leukocytes and therefore there is a close relation between the uh, secretion of adipokines on the one hand and the cellular uh, inflammation. Therefore, the balance between anti-inflammatory adipokines and pro-inflammatory adipokines goes to the inflammation side in obese patients. This might also guide us to obstructive sleep apnea as an inflammatory disease. So we have um, um, radicals, uh, we have oxidative stress leading to inflammation. So also obstructive sleep apnea, as we know, is an inflammatory disease or has at least inflammatory components. So this might be the link between obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, and COVID-19. There are also mechanical aspects in uh, obstructive sleep in obesity uh, associating these two diseases, leading to upper airway obstruction, as we know, but also impairment of hypercapnic ventilatory res response, so ventilation, so leading to obesity hyperventilation, and all increasing work of breathing. So we have mechanical aspects, we have problems with, with gas exchange, and we have inflammation. In addition, similar comorbidities characterize COVID-19 and obstructive sleep apnea. Actually, we know that diabetes, hypertension, coronary and cerebrovascular diseases lead to um, higher mortality in both diseases. Therefore, one would expect that there is a close uh, numerical um, association between COVID-19, obesity, and obstructive sleep apnea. However, by now, we have very limited data on the, this association. Actually, we have only two small studies, one from Arendt and colleagues with 21 patients, 
showing that 28% of the population suffered from obstructive sleep apnea. And the, the other one with 24 patients also showing a proportion of 21% of patients suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. So not very consistent, not very uh, high numbers, not very substantial data, only some hints showing the association between COVID-19 and obstructive sleep apnea. So let me put these aspects together. We have an obese patient. He uh, presents with biomechanical factors, reduced lung compliance, reduced functional residual capacity, um, airway hyperresponsiveness, obstructive sleep apnea, and finally hypoxemia. We have systemic factors, especially the inflammation uh, as indicated by obesity, but also obstructive sleep apnea, leading to different metabolic imbalances also. And finally, we have socioeconomic factors as they discussed in the relation to ethnicity. And all these factors together increase the risk, the vulnerability to um, the infection with SARS-CoV-2 and increases also the likelihood of severe cause of COVID-19 and increases the mortality rate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Winfred, um, for this nice presentation. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Anita Simons, our uh, president-elect of the European Respiratory Society. We are very honored to have her here. Um, she lives in London, and uh, she will talk about uh, uh, problems with uh, um, uh, non-invasive ventilation, and also uh, she will give us some information on uh, um, the importance of COVID-19 uh, in changing pediatric sleep uh, uh, practice nowadays. Please, Anita. Thank you so much, Marisa, and also to Sophia for setting this up so quickly. Um, and, and I'm glad to talk to everyone. I have a very practical topic. Um, and uh, just to move on, I don't have a particular conflict of interest apart from taking part in the recovery RS trial of respiratory support in uh, acute COVID. So the background is that uh, I will cover what happened to sleep services during the surge of COVID and subsequently what's happening now as services are starting to get up and running again and catching up. I appreciate that uh, different countries are on different points of that evolution of that curve from surge to a kind of recovery, um, but, but also we may all see uh, further surges. So I think the considerations are, of course, a major one is infection control. We have the general principles in managing our patients, plus we have the added complication in our uh, patient group that CPAP and non-invasive ventilation, also high flow nasal oxygen, are aerosol generating procedures, or at least a droplet generating procedures, but they're classified as AGPs. Also, as a consequence of uh, COVID, there was a major impact on all sorts of resources. Staff, uh, particularly skilled in CPAP and non-invasive ventilation, were deployed in managing uh, uh, acute COVID patients in ICU, on the respiratory wards, on the high dependency unit. Um, sleep space areas were redeployed. In fact, this is our pediatric, uh, one of the pediatric sleep areas, and that was converted to a donning and doffing area. Uh, and then over and above that, not just staff and space, equipment was also diverted. So some of our high-end non-invasive ventilators and sometimes CPAP machines were used in COVID patients. So that had a huge impact on, on services. As a consequence, we, uh, for obvious reasons, did less face-to-face -face consultations. It simply wasn't possible to do that. There have been far fewer inpatient admissions, and it's been very difficult, as you'll see from the subsequent surveys, to do sleep studies such as polysonography. And referrals were reduced too. 
In mitigation, what most centres did was increase remote consultation uh, via um, teleconsults or video consults. They employed uh, increased remote monitoring um, and those methods too to deal with problems that arose in, in existing patients. And then there's also the possibilities, although not always straightforward, of doing home visits or outreach visits. And this really involved huge flexibility of the multidisciplinary team. But despite all that, um, service delivery has been uh, reduced, um, particularly initiation of CPAP and non-invasive ventilation in, in most centres, with the result that there is an increased waiting list. Um, there's also been limited access to alternatives such as mandibular advancement splints because of uh, the impact of COVID or, or, on, on dental surgeries. The only way to manage this situation where you have the reduced availability of services to prioritize, and I think most people are prioritized by considering the severity of the sleep disordered breathing, uh, look particularly at occupational critical um, patients, particularly frontline um, workers, for example, and then where sleep disordered breathing has had a major impact on comorbidities or there are particular intercurrent issues such as urgent surgery required or in a pregnant patient. Um, of interest, as, as we were kind of just talking about, I think new patients have been diagnosed in the acute COVID patients. Um, and we really have a pressing need as we've changed these uh, care pathways to evaluate them and understand how effective they are. This is a very nice study, which has just appeared as a, a detailed letter in the European uh, Respiratory Journal, um, uh, gathered by Luda Groot, looking at uh, impact on sleep services using the ASADA group. And they have examined across Europe activities in 40 sleep centers uh, during three months, two to three months of the COVID period. And I've just highlighted the practical procedures, because I know Francesco is going to come back to the individual sleep studies uh, subsequently, but you can see this is level activity prior to COVID, and this is during the height of the COVID surge, and you can see a massive reduction in inpatient in-lab uh, titrations. Uh, all activity is reduced, but a lesser impact, uh, but still reduced uh, ambulatory titration, but maintained uh, telemedicine and APAP titration and similar sorts of very significant impact on uh, non-invasive ventilation setups and then big impact to one follow-up. And you can see, I'll just uh, hide that, overall if, to summarize what happened is there's about an 80% reduction in sleep, servi sleep services uh, this uh, ASADA survey showed staffing levels were reduced to about 20%, 19 to 25% of the usual number of staff in the sleep service. And as I just mentioned, there were minimal numbers of polysonography and reduced uh, PAP setups. This is the uh, flow chart. So taking together from the separate survey that uh, Sophia and uh, Marisa and the team gathered, again, going across centers in Europe, you can see uh, really the principles, this flow chart of what happened. Now, there are some things we can influence and some things that we can't necessarily influence. Um, and infection control guidance is set by WHO, is set by the CDC, and is set by our national guidelines and then local guidance. So we have to work with that. Um, and that depends on the kind of precautions, the screening we carry out, symptomatic screening, and uh, 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 in, in terms of the swab that patients need before they come in. Having done that, we have two things that we need to do, having established they need, say, CPAP therapy. We have to understand the titration as the uh, uh, appropriate levels of CPAP they require, and CPAP has to be initiated. Now, that can be done separately or together. And as we saw, there, are still, there is still a, a small degree of inpatient titration going on but there are other modes of uh, doing this, setting up um, positive airway pressure 
as a, 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 a day stay, a day attendance, and then having home APAP or home uh, PAP monitoring with telemonitoring or a, a further uh, in-lab assessment. Um, these are the sort of uh, precautions that we need to take. It being an aerosol generating procedure, there is this kind of level of PPE that is required for aerosol generating procedures. Um, and uh, there are other points too that I, I think we know too well, that is that humidification is not necessarily uh, recommended. Um, and in terms of making the circuit safer to use a non-vented mask um, and then to have a, a leak in the circuit but filter the leak with a, a, an exhalation valve and that reduces the uh, droplet and aerosol dissemination. As far as non-invasive ventilation goes, then I think we're in the same situation. It may be possible to do in-lab uh, titration, or in some cases, and we'll discuss this briefly in the, in P, in the pediatric survey too, there may be, it may be possible to do home initiation and titration. I'm just waiting for it to advance. So this is the um, pediatric survey, again, across uh, pediatric centers in Europe. And this is courtesy, uh, must thank uh, Rafika Ursu for this data. In effect, you'll see uh, that it's relatively similar to uh, for adults, um, obviously uh, prioritizing the patients. So those patients in whom it will be most effective if their study is, is delayed. Uh, the fact that we need to take account the parents and the carers uh, for the ad admission or for the home setup um, and the usual screening um, processes that are in accordance to your uh, local guidance. Um, what uh, Rafika has mentioned here is that PPE for droplet precautions during the sleep study, I would say droplet pre pre precautions because that's not necessarily for AGP precautions for a sleep study but droplets and uh, aerosol precautions for the positive airway pressure set up. Um, it's true too that there is work going on and that res home respiratory polygraphy uh, is, is being performed, I think probably increasingly in children, in adults as well. Uh, it may be easier to do in children with, with no comorbidities or more sensible to do in that situation. But this study, which showed quite good success rates, both for clinical trials and for clinical studies, uh, was actually in a, a large series of Down syndrome children. And the equipment for the home studies is either picked up by the family uh, uh, and or uh, 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 one of the multidisciplinary team takes the equipment to the patient's home and then sets it up and collects it subsequently. So particular issues with non-invasive ventilation, I think um, problems that we've faced is that uh, many of the patient groups, particularly those with severe COPD or non-invasive ventilation may be shielding at home, very anxious about visiting hospitals and therefore telemonitoring, teleconsults and outreach visits are, are important for them. In terms of prioritization, uh, the groups that uh, were most often needed um, urgent uh, NIV setups were those with motor neuron disease, acute on chronic ventilatory decompensation, and also to facilitate hospital discharge. I've mentioned the potential role of outreach and home setups. Um, it's less easy to do transcutaneous CO2 monitoring in the home, but it's very useful for diagnosis um, for the neuromuscular uh, chronic ventilatory failure patients um, and to problem solve in that group. It may require a home team visit or the family picks up the device and returns it again. That combined with telemonitoring data, so data downloads from the ventilator uh, is, is the, the most effective way I think in this getting the settings right. Uh, there was hoped for a role for the new hybrid, the volume assured and newer models of ventilation, which would help titration, but I think that they, they may do that, but to a relatively limited extent. And so the, um, for the setting up and then management of the established community of patients we, we already have, 
who was started on treatment uh, pre-COVID is exactly, uh, as I said, with telephone and video uh, consult advice. Um, equipment problems, delivery of equipment and consumables had to be solved. Essentially, and I'd be interested in your opinion, uh, we didn't change patients in the community to COVID cir circuits. They continue to use their own vented masks um, uh, and we didn't add extra uh, bacterial filters into the circuit, but that does have an impact on, on issues with carers and issues with PPE in the home and managing risk in the home. In the interest of time, I'll move on. So one thing I would say is that when we're managing our patients, whether we're diagnosing their uh, sleep apnea or their hypoventilation, or we're trying to manage symptoms, it's impossible not to take into account the significant impact of uh, COVID on sleep of, of all of us. Um, and uh, you've probably answered surveys yourself. I've taken part in a number of them of the impact of of the lockdown, of the uh, uh, impact of, of COVID in the population as a whole on people's sleep in adults and children. And there's a very large international uh, survey of the impact of the lockdown um, and, and uh, COVID in the community on, on sleep quality. Interestingly, the, the effects of the lockdown are, are really multifactorial, some strangely beneficial and some not at all so. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more publications. It's, it's early days yet for the publications, but circadian drift has been noticed, reduced exercise in people who are under really severe lockdown conditions. Some people were not able to leave their home. A lot more screen time, disruption of routines, particularly schooling for children, a lot more home working, and then variable levels of anxiety and distress and a kind of hyper arousal state of people really anxious about developing COVID and this new concept, psychiatric con concept of derailment. In effect, everyone's lives have been um, derailed to some extent. Uh, there's a study uh, um, just published uh, suggesting that uh, insomnia is uh, affecting about a third of the population um, or, or just more than that. And the risk factors seem to be in this study at any rate which is largely done in Greece, uh, it's slightly more prevalent in females, those living in cities rather than the countries, and those who are already isolated. Um, this is a, a fascinating study, again, just published on circadian impact. Um, what they looked at was, and this is in a, a, a general population, uh, in fact, a working population, but they were then largely working at home was the impact on something called social jet lag, which is a mismatch between uh, our social activities and our body clock. Failed to sleep restriction, sleep duration and sleep quality during uh, COVID um, and then uh, uh, com uh, during COVID and, and, and compared to normal times. In fact, interestingly, there was less social jet lag because people were able to work at home and they were able to uh, adjust to that. And so there was less social, social jet lag uh, and there was less sleep restriction, again, with people largely working at home. It, it, funnily enough, sleep duration was also increased, not by a huge amount, by about uh, 13 minutes, but cumulatively that adds up. So that was the increase. But um, of note was that the sleep quality decreased. And so that although there might be more sleep, more sleep time available, the quality of that sleep was not as good. Um, there are a number of ways to manage this, particularly for children. I think uh, the family as a whole, it needs to be a family approach to maintain stable routines. This is pretty straightforward and uh, self-evident really. Bright light exposure in the morning, balancing screen time, reducing night use. And in particularly the group were, um, very keen at increasing exercise was helpful in improving uh, sleep quality. I'll quickly move on. So, so where are we at the moment? Well, as I said, there are some things we can control and some things we can't control. Uh, we have very little impact on the prevalence and how that is going to evolve over time and whether there's a vaccine or treatments. But I think, you know, commendably, people have adapted and sleep teams become very versatile and we inevitably have to move to a more virtual service, virtual sleep service. 
Uh, but the issue there is that we all know that some patients re really need more input than others and we need to personalize care. We had a very interesting question from the European Lung Foundation about adapting masks to individuals and that's very difficult to do that remotely. You might be able to do it by a video consult, but more normally you would do that in a face-to-face -face consultation. Infection control management will evolve and, and probably change to some extent over time. But as a result of uh, the whole episode, many centers now have large waiting lists and need waiting list initiatives and need to prioritize patients. And there's some issues too with the telemonitoring of reimbursement and government's is governance issues. And on top of all this, we of course, which is a good thing, I suppose, have a whole new research agenda. Uh, whether you want to go onto the question or not, um, I'm happy to go either way, Marisa, but this was just one question about what are aerosol generation procedures or not, performing polysonography, performing respiratory polygraphy, setting up CPAP, or setting up cough insulation. So I'll let people have a few more seconds and then Ali, maybe you can show the results. Perfect, I think that's correct. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Anita, for the excellent presentation and for covering that such a huge topic in such a short time. Um, before we move into the to our last uh, speaker, uh, please uh, uh, post questions to the chat uh, room uh, in order to 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 discuss and exchange uh, uh, ideas. Please do so. And uh, last but not least, uh, now uh, we'll speak uh, uh, Francesco Fanfula, Dr. Dr. Francesco Fanfulla. Uh, he's a well-known uh, sleep expert, expert, and more than that, he's coming for a really, really hot area from Pavia and Lombardia. And he will speak about sleep lab operation during uh, uh, pandemic, sharing his experience and the experience of the working group until now. Francesco. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Uh, fit to the window. I'm not able to move the, uh, okay. Okay, thank you, Sofia. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. My talk is uh, uh, focused on the sleep labs operation after lockdown. I have not a uh, uh, conflict of interest to, to declare. And just to start my talk, I would like to, to invite you to, to answer this question. Should the diagnosis and treatment of sleep disorders be stopped during major events like COVID-19 pandemic? You have a four option. Please vote. We can see the, the results. No, okay. It's mm -hmm. correct. Very, very, very good. So I'll focus my talk on uh, two different points. The first is uh, the modality to, uh, to assess to the sleep laboratory. And the second is precaution for diagnostic sleep test and pap titration in the present endemic or uh, living with phase, phase two or phase three. Okay, this is the slide. Oops, there is some trouble. I don't know why. Okay, this is the uh, a slide that summarizes what happened in Europe during the lockdown, the lockdown period regarding the activity of sleep laboratory in the SADA group. And uh, as you can see, there is uh, the, the activity was very, very minimal. And uh, 
these are limited resources for uh, telemedicine and telemonitoring. And the authors concluded that uh, there is a need for specific strategies of care for patients with, sus with or suspected sleep disorder breathing during major event like uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Are you having some trouble in moving the, the slide? Okay. Uh, in the last two months, there are uh, many statements were produced by uh, national uh, respirator and sleep society, sleep medicine society and sleep operation during pandemic. However, the, uh, most of them are focused on uh, the peak of pandemia and not during, uh, not for uh, reopening phase. So uh, the panel of the expert uh, um, finalized a document on, uh, based on uh, taking into account four different uh, items, the pandemic status that is ongoing change, the national and the local uh, guideline, the risk and benefit analysis, particular for patients at risk for severe form of COVID-19 and uh, in terms of negative impact of undiagnosed or untreated sleep disorder breathing in terms of development of severe COVID-19 form or uh, development of complication. And, the final, and finally, the, uh, fourth, uh, the fourth issue, the fourth point is the uh, design of a specific organi uh, organization in, uh, uh, for screening patients and staff for COVID-19 and for uh, um, uh, sleep activity, uh, for uh, uh, design a specific protocol for the cleaning procedures and staff protection. Overall, uh, the uh, telemedicine and home test are preferred. So this uh, uh, flowchart summarized what the panel of experts suggest for evaluation of patients before uh, they access to, see, to sleep center. It is suggested to screen by phone every patient 24 up to 36 hours before visit by a standard questionnaire that should include uh, the collection of symptoms suggested for uh, COVID-19 and uh, for collection of history contact with uh, subject diagnosed or suspected for uh, COVID-19. In the place, if the uh, screening is uh, positive, uh, the patient is, the visit should be stopped and postponed unless the patient may, be, may perform an uh, oral nasal swab. If, if, uh, if negative, uh, the, day, uh, the day of the visit of the patient will be checked uh, for body temperature measurement at entering in the hospital and then uh, um, submitted again uh, to the screening uh, questionnaire. Again, if the patient is positive, will be positive uh, back to home. If negative, the visit will be performed. Okay, here I graphically uh, presented the procedures and uh, precaution for diagnostic sleep test. As stated before in the previous slide, all the patients should, should be screened the day before and checked the same day of the visit. And uh, home tests are preferred according to the epidemiological status, uh, status of COVID-9 and especially when the, uh, the risk of transmission is very, very high and the virus is spread in the community. So the panel of experts identified three, three uh, different level of general precaution for general precaution to avoid uh, any infection, general protective measure for patients and protective measure for health professionals and staff. Particularly, care is claimed for limitation of uh, power, uh, setting adequate time between patients for uh, uh, exact time of appointment and for uh, limitation of administrative procedures in order to avoid any overcrowding in waiting room and to reduce at minimum the time spent in hospital. The use of disposable equipment or sensor is recommended if available and clinical, uh, clinical procedure for room and equipment should be reported in a specific uh, protocol in, uh, in each laboratory. Okay, however, there are some uh, 
specific technical issues in performing sleep diagnostic tests. The first is the clinic of equipment and the American Academy uh, of Sleep Medicine suggests in addition to standard clinical procedures reported by manufacturer to quarantine the device for at least 72 hours as an extra precaution, especially when the community spread is very high or moderate. However, this represents a big limitation for the operability of a sleep uh, center. We can make at maximum two tests a week for each device. So the second, uh, the second technical issue regarding the use of nasal can cannula during the diagnostic test. Indeed, there are some warning about the theoretical, hypothetical uh, possibility of, of uh, cross-contamination of the pressure transducer. So we have two, the pos two possibilities at the moment. The first one is to quarantine, again, to quarantine the equipment for 72 hours. And the second is the use of uh, uh, platysmography derived parameters like the sum or the flow but the uh, quality and stability of these signals are a critical point, particularly for home or an unattended study, or in particular for less severe patients. So I want to show you what we use at the moment in our laboratory. We create a sort of homemade circuit that uh, interposes an antiviral filter between the nasal cannula and the pressure transducer. Here, we uh, first we validated the uh, the circuit in a group of healthy volunteers and in the left part of the slide you can see the signal recorded uh, recording uh, uh, with the standard cannula in the uh, with in the normal breathing and during uh, <coughs> and respiratory events and the right part of the slide what happened the same uh, signals recorded simultaneously with the, the cannula plus filter as you can see the quality of the same uh, the, the signal are exactly the same so <coughs> Second, we, uh, we tested, we compared uh, the data in, uh, in 20 patients and we compared the global AGI and obstructive AGI derived from uh, uh, platysmography uh, derived uh, flow and uh, the flow derived from the nasal cannula plus filters. As you can see, the um, the AGI obtained with the practismography derived flow underestimate the AGI in all the patients but one here and here. This is the, the black is the identity line. So we want to conclude this presentation uh, with the final sentence of uh, a paper that uh, by Sergio Tufik and co-workers that was uh, very recently accepted by Juna Clinical Sleep Medicine. Um, and the author stressed the idea that uh, undiagnosed or untreated OSA may represent may be dangerous for COVID-9 patients and suggests to screen every COVID-9 patient for, uh, uh, to enable a better delineation of risk factors and to formulate a more accurate prevention strategy and therapeutic approach. So not only to screen, to diagnose and to make therapy for a standard, a standard population at risk for SA, but also to screen, to treat and to manage the COVID-19 patients for sleep apnea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesco, for this excellent presentation. Marisa. Uh... Well, I have uh, um, a question to all the panelists before we look at the questions that uh, arrived uh, from the audience. Um, if, if I can see the slide, um, the last slide, Ali, could you please put it up? There's one slide after this. Maybe not. Okay, so I'll say it. Uh, well, the thing is that there are um, uh, the, the World Health Organization has recently changed the criteria 
to consider a patient not uh, no, no longer um, infectious. So uh, this is a time of uncertainty for many, many uh, procedures, many medical procedures, because the, 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 the picture is changing quite rapidly. So it is absolutely important to uh, keep an eye on these uh, uh, rules, but uh, be extremely cautious um, in uh, uh, what we decide to do in the sleep labs, because I would stay more on the cautious side uh, rather than uh, open up everything uh, and go back uh, to uh, the old times. So the, um, the, as for the questions, um, there, is a, uh, there is one specific question to Anita, on uh, exhaled air dispersion during high flow nasal cannula versus CPAP via different masks. Have you seen that? Yes, I did. It's, it's a very interesting question. And I, 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 in theory, I think it's a very good idea. Um, in practice, uh, it depends on how well you fit the mask as well as the design of the mask. It depends on the position of the patient. Um, so there are lots of variables, but uh, you know, the better fitting the mask, therefore the better design the mask, I think the less likely you are to have leak because ultimately what we're doing is with our uh, COVID circuit, we're filtering uh, exhalation, but we do nothing to deal with the leak around the mask. And therefore, if you have a better fitting mask, that that's a good idea. Thank you. Okay, then uh, um, there is uh, um, another uh, non-vented mask versus vented mask in children. Uh, how useful it, it is in children using NIV or tracheostomy ventilation. So uh, do you, what is your opinion on the, um, on the NIV in children? Are you, you're still using open masks, right? Yeah, I mean, I, first a caveat, I, I work mainly with um, transitional sleep clinic patients, although I'm involved with children on NIV. I think that there can be a, a real problem using non-vented masks. Um, if you don't have a bigger enough leak, then there can be a lot of resistance in the circuit. Um, you have to be careful about the, um, the filters getting waterlogged. And therefore, if you're going to use mitigation using full PPE with, with the child in hospital, then um, I think you may have to use a vented mask. Um, ultimately, you have to get the, the NIV and the CPAP to work and for them to be able to use it comfortably. So there are a balance of risks to be taken into account. Well, there is a question for uh, uh, Winfred. Uh, are the risk factor of obstructive sleep apnea or obesity hypoventilation syndrome predict the responsiveness of the patient to CPAP or NIV in case of respiratory failure related to COVID? Actually, we do not have any data about that because we do not have um, systematic analyses on, on uh, obstructive sleep apnea and OHS uh, regarding treatment in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, so I can only uh, answer from my uh, personal impression so if a patient with uh, severe obesity and obstructive sleep apnea and obesity, high, obesity hyperventilation is admitted to the hospital and suffers from uh, respiratory failure, either hypoxic or hypercapnic, uh, it's bo in both cases, it makes sense to uh, unload um, respiratory muscles and to reduce uh, the, the work of breathing. Uh, so in that situation, I would prefer to start with uh, positive airway pressure, either CPAP, APAP, or non-invasive ventilation, depending on, on uh, hypercapnia or not, uh, to reduce the work of breathing. And therefore, um, uh, I would hope to um, improve the situation uh, prior to invasive ventilation. So this is instead of, or bef uh, instead of starting with oxygen or high flow oxygen in this group of patients. So for the other patients, we would start for non obese patients, we would always start with oxygen, high, uh, high flow oxygen. But for this group, I would start with, with uh, positive airway pressure or non invasive ventilation. 
so we do not have data to answer the question on, on uh, if it predicts better outcome or predicts um, effectiveness, but this is how I would do it. Can I ask to Francesco his uh, experience with uh, uh, COVID-19 in obstructive sleep apnea patients or patients who are on CPAP or NIV? So did you, did you have, among the millions of patients you had, <laughs> also uh, patients who were, were already on... Um... No, the, 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 you're mute. You're mute. Okay, sorry. Okay. So in the, in the experience, in the direct experience during the COVID period in our world, uh, we have uh, a more or less five to six patients with uh, diagnosed, uh, diagnosed OSA, all of them with very poor compliance or null compliance before the COVID-19. So we are performing a survey for, uh, for all our patients on telemonitoring and only six patients, about 300, were affected for COVID-19. My idea is that CPAP before the COVID-19 may be protective for very severe form of pulmonary lesions. So I don't know if this is correct, but uh, this is one impression that we have uh, regarding all the patients. Maybe I can add something if that's okay, Marisa. Yes. Uh, it's a very interesting hypothesis. Um, it, it's actually surprising. We, we too experienced very, we expected to see a lot of our existing patients with obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP coming in with COVID complications. Unlike you, Francesco, we, we didn't. So we have two kind. Of, we have uh, recovered in our world two, only two kind of patients: patients in the remission phase from acute respiratory failure or acute form of COVID-19, and the second group is uh, the patients that were admitted to our hospital for rehabilitation. I work in a, a mixed hospital rehabilitation plus acute disease, and uh, uh, most of them are patients that with severe comorbidities, generally very old, and uh, um, so it's not so representative for uh, patients from uh, acute respiratory world. So we have uh, more or less uh, 15 to 20% of very severe cases that go to uh, helmets or uh, invasive ventilation, but uh, the great majority uh, did not. So um, just to, uh, to focus on your question, uh, we have not, we had the idea that uh, OSA patients are not uh, uh, at risk for severe form of, uh, in, in, in this specific population. Uh, we, are, we are not aware that OSA was a, a big problem for uh, the patients, but the great majority of the patients were not obese. They're very lean or with a severe form of malnutrition. Just, just one last comment, um, if, if I may. There's, a, there's a, um, a point here that's been raised. Were the sleep apnea patients shieldings? Um, so were they at home and not? And, um, in, in our experience, at any rate, they were not shielding. The non-invasive ventilation patients, neuromuscular disease, severe COPD patients were shielding um, and therefore didn't mix, but most of the obstructive sleep apnea patients were not shielding. Uh, in, in my experience, but I'd be interested to know about others. Okay. Well, there are some questions on uh, uh, humidifier home use and production of droplets, uh, on uh, the fact that filters affecting pressures delivered by the PAP device. Uh, so there are technical, uh, technical questions on, uh, um, on the... the the use of filters, um, what is your opinion? Filters in the device or humidifiers. And there is also another question asking whether uh, the use of CPAP in uh, sleep apnea patients can spread the virus to others. So these are more patient type of questions. So uh, effectiveness of treatment with the filter use and possibility to spread the virus 
at home, essentially. What is your opinion? Who are you asking? Well, please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Anita already uh, mentioned an important point that the, the largest problem is uh, the leakage. Um, if the mask fits uh, well, uh, it's not such a problem with the filters. Uh, if, if there is a filter and um, it's not such a problem with, um, uh, with exhalation port, but uh, the, the problem is the leakage. So um, this, this seems to be the most important point. However, I think we have to uh, clearly point out which situation we are talking about. Are we talking about the patient at home using his CPAP, his or her CPAP device? Uh, he's at no higher risk than anybody else um, at home. It might be obvious, but this question has often been raised by patients um, sending emails or, or calling us. So um, they, they were considering not to use their devices in their own home, in their own family, because they were afraid of uh, getting COVID-19. The second group is the, 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 those patients who come to the hospital for initiation of treatment or for, for um, follow-up. And uh, um, if they are in their, in their own room, and if they are COVID negative, they don't have any risk uh, similar to, to the home situation. But once again, there were many patients who did not want to come to hospital because they were afraid to get COVID-19 in the hospital. So we lost many patients within that period uh, from follow-up because they did not um, join us. And the, the third group, and this is what we have to, to focus from, from the point of, of uh, nurses and, and staff and so on, is a patient with COVID-19 or with, who is SARS positive and has, uh, is treated, or when we do not know if he's positive or not. So these are situations uh, with, with risk situations for the, for the uh, environment, for the, for the, for the staff. Um, and there we need uh, the whole um, protection of our staff. So, so it seems not to be a risk for the patients at all if they're not two, with two or three in one room, but there might be a potential risk in for the staff, but not for anybody else. So, so from the point of using the devices, humidifiers, um, we would not recommend to do anything else um, as in normal times. Well, uh, there is also uh, another comment uh, that uh, I could make, uh, and that is that there are different rules uh, in each country, yeah. especially concerning reimbursement. And this is uh, affecting the behavior of sleep centers much more than the COVID-19. So probably uh, we need to, to push our politicians in order to have, for example, telemedicine reimbursed, because there is no doubt that uh, telemedicine could be of great help in situations where we want to limit the access of patients to the hospital, or the patient don't want to come to the hospital because they are afraid. So the, the situation may vary according to the different uh, epidemic status of each country at a certain time. But certainly if uh, telemedicine is not reimbursed as it is in many countries, then there is no question there will not be that much telemedicine because it, nobody can, can afford it. So um, now there are uh, other, other um, other questions. Uh, there is Dr. Mukesh Kapoor who asks all panelists, just to clarify, you are saying that you did not see a lot of patients with obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP come to the hospital with COVID-19. I think that uh, this is the case and the, the severe ones were a small percentage, but this is a rule of thumb coming from practical daily life. We do not have studies on this. Then there is another question uh, on split night studies. Uh, do you think split night studies might be helpful? 
So concentrating uh, diagnosis and treatment in one night instead than in two separate nights. Panelists. Who, who responds? 25 uh, years ago, we demonstrated that split night is not a good method for diagnosis and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and titration. So. so this is uh, pre-COVID science. Okay. I, would also, I would also agree um, not to use a split night for another reason. If you, um, if you have a patient with COVID-19 or with uh, suspe suspicion, um, it's better to have a clear cut between diagnosis where there's no increased risk for the, um, for the, for the stuff or only little, uh, compared to changing within the night, the situation, putting the mask on, putting the device on uh, in a very unclear and difficult situation within the night. So I would prefer to separate uh, this and have a clear diagnostical approach and then a treatment approach with preparing everything nicely during the day. Okay, just going back to the telemedicine, our friend Renata uh, from, I, from uh, Edinburgh, she says that uh, they have, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, mailed uh, automatic CPAP machines and they use telemonitoring and telephone consultation, sending also masks. So minimizing contact, I think uh, this is the way to go, probably in the future to also to, uh, to decrease the overload of the sleep centers. So this is a, a way we have to, to go uh, to and uh, to try to, to make uh, uh, cost effective and, uh, um, and good for the patient and the, the sleep lab. Uh, I think we should stop here. And Sophia, you're welcome to add any final comment. Um, I think that uh, I, besides that, I really enjoyed it. And I would like to thank all of you uh, for your participations uh, and the, the great talks. Uh, and the participants as well, because they stimulate the discussion. Uh, we, I think that we had uh, a way uh, in front of us uh, and we have to keep uh, working for um, a suggestions or research, especially for potential protective, uh, uh, to, to reveal protective effects uh, of, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for our patients concerning CPAP treatment and the further um, uh, positive effect in the COVID uh, uh, deterioration. Uh, uh, we need collaboration and that's a uh, promise from uh, our group. Uh, we will do our best in this direction uh, and uh, thank you all. Okay, then uh, I also finish and uh, I thank you all uh, too. And uh, uh, we will work hard to make uh, this uh, paper coming out, come out uh, uh, hopefully in a short time. Uh, we wanted to see uh, the, the response uh, to, from you to this uh, webinar and we are happy um, it was very good. So we can go ahead in writing and uh, we thank you really very much for staying here uh, so late if, today uh, and uh, keep safe and uh, that's it. Thank you for all the panelists. Thank you to Ali and uh, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you to Ali, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Have a good evening and night. Yeah. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.